Thank you all for coming today. I am very excited to be introducing to you our spring lecture for our Lucky Gatha series, Mary Ann Thompson Frank, who is the co-founder and president of the Memosine Institute and the John Phillips Thompson Foundation. She is frequently the requested international speaker, having spoken at the UN several times, as well as for the Forza Lab Initiative, Step Global Congress, Nexus Youth Summit, etc. She travels a lot. We had dinner last night and I got a sense of that. She is also a mediator, including negotiating the first alliance treaty in 300 years between the Hopi and Navajo nations. And she's also worked with the Liberian Truth and Reconciliation she is also an award-winning sculptor and also an avid collector of art. Uh, she's a board member for several organizations. Marianne has been published in various magazines, including the Transpersonal Psychology Association's The Transcender, Waikido's Real Leaders magazine, which recognized her as a real young leader to watch on the international stage. She's contributed chapters to various books, including Dawn of the Akashic Age, New Consciousness, Quantum Renaissance, and the Future of the World. She has done so much. I could go on and on and on. Let me just give you a couple of other brief highlights before I turn it over to her. I think one thing that is very uh, emblematic of Marianne and of her work is a quote that she provided me <coughs> when we first met. And it illustrates your path and your journey. I think it's inspiring um, for those of us here today which is we are the first generation of human beings to have no excuse for ignorance. So the question isn't whether or not you wish to affect your change. Passivity is a decision, not an avoidance of taking action. So with that, I am going to hand it over to our speaker, Marianne. Please help me in welcoming her. Art and activism. You know, that seemed like such a huge jump up. I was like, what better I do? Art and activism. How does that relate to each other? But then I started thinking about it and I realized that one actually can't really exist without the other. Because when you're active, you're creating, you're asking yourself, you're looking out into the world and you're wondering, what can I do? How can I put something out there? And when you're creating, you're having to respond to the world, you're having to talk back to the world. Most of us in our day-to-day -day lives, we're very passive. We sit at home, we look at the news, and we think, oh, isn't that just terrible? Someone should do something about that, and then we flip the channel to the next thing so we don't have to think about it. That's really pretty much how we go about our lives. But if you're actually daring to do something amazing in your life, if you're actually daring to say, how can I become something bigger, something greater, how can I actually leave a mark on this world and do something makes me move, makes somebody next to me move. How can I walk into the room and sit at a restaurant and look across the room and see a complete stranger and go, how did I affect their life today? Because the amazing thing is, in this day and age, you did. The amazing thing is this day and age, when you walk across the campus to come here, and you have all sorts of people that you will never meet again in your life. You have affected their world. You've affected their world in how you buy, You've affected the world and how you consume, how you interact with somebody. You've affected the world and how you vote. You affect the world not bothering them both. You affect their world and what kind of car you drive. You affect their world and what kind of idealisms you hold inside and how you correspond with that. So when we look at the relationship between art and activism, it's more about how am I going to become conscious of something that is absolutely innate to being human? Because what is being human other than to be receiving from the world and interacting with each other? That's pretty much the most honest definition of being human. So when I was looking at how do I come and talk to all of you today about the relationship between art and activism, I thought, well, I could sit there and say, well, let's look at all my art that I've made and look at figure A through B and look at the, no, I'm not going to do that to you. <laughs> I know that that is probably the most boring lecture that you could get. So instead, I'd like to challenge each of you 
to go with me in a journey today and find out what is the relationship between art and activism in each of your lives and how exactly does that make it possible for you to become the empowered individuals each of you have the potential to be? So that's the challenge. So I know that this is largely part from the art department. So raise your hand if you can draw something resembling anything. I know that there's more than that because you guys are not on the Okay. So, uh, so someone raise it higher because they're all timid. These little hands are going like this. Again, if you can draw something resembling anything, raise your hand so I can actually see it. Thank you. Okay. Will you please come up? Will you please come up? Yes. I see a young boy back there. Go ahead. Come on up.
And as you encounter these different things, each one is more overwhelming than the next. But you're still here. So when it's raw, and you have something authentic like that, that's connecting with the human being, and you're being able to do this, shows an incredible strength. So thank you. So something strong, something that shows standing against the wind, a light in the dark, however you all interpret it. Well, it'll be nothing because she's red, so whoever's yellow. So please. <laughs> um, well, when I was um, when I was a little um, when I when I started school, and one of the like, things was that if um, and I still remember to this day, the first day of school, I walked in and because I couldn't speak English at all, I got put in a remedial class, and so we were branded as the less intelligent. And uh, it's, uh, uh, we have really passionate teachers in our schools that help us, you know, to learn English for the one year. So it's, uh, it's something that uh, I still remember that one day. That one when you knew you had something more of a nice thing. There you go. <laughs> okay, so you asked me, uh, I wish I would have said something stronger. Mm -hmm. I was shopping in the GB and I saw a bargain. So I raised my hand and started uh, celebrating the bargain. Uh, really, really. It was so good. <laughs> <laughs> a white lady uh, stopped me, tapped me on the shoulder, and turned around. And she was like, oh my God, I thought you were doing gay signs. I was like, wait, what? My knee cast came out. I was like, well, what? Um, and I asked her, like, excuse me, what? what? So yeah, I thought I thought you were doing gigs in the thickest sense of that time. We were in my life. Um, I walked away like laughing, and I was with a friend, and you know, it took me a couple of days to realize, my God, there are children who are being killed because of things, because of loud music, and my mom could be picking me up and yelling out, you know what I'm saying? Just because it's one of those friends. And so looking back, I really, really do wish I was. Not a bunch of curls, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> giving her a little bit of a lesson on the critical race to do it. Hey, yes. That's understandable. <laughs> there you go. We're all something that relates to that. <laughs> um, I think that's something that makes me feel strong in. I think that's like sort of a um, negative stereotype. So is there a particular instance or something from the mind that really got um, you? Now? I wouldn't say a particular instance, but just I think struggling as a young female artist and finding professional opportunities and also just artistic opportunities in general to do better. So. I understand. Okay. There you go. <laughs> so um, you guys can see. Next thing I know, I'm screaming 
asking for help. Anybody, anybody help me. And one after another, boom, boom, you know, I got their homes right there in my back. Running as fast as I can, trying to get to the Castilian, go through that alley, screaming, screaming. And right there, the police there, <laughs> boys will be boys. The deep anger that I felt in that moment, as the police are going, boys will be boys. And I'm feeling, boom. And I'm looking behind me, and I'm seeing them unzip their pants, and I'm thinking I'm going to get gang raped in that alley right there between the dragon where the Castilian is. It was so innate and visceral. And when that security guard came out, and he found me halfway through, he got me, I went in there. And I went in there, and I'm, you know, I'm trying to talk to somebody because I'm not even processing what just happened. And what was I told by the people at the Castilian? Ah, boys, they'll be boys. By fraternity, they kind of want to just, you know, they, they were required to do something. And it was like that made it okay. Well, it didn't make it okay. But at that age, in that place and time, it made me very quiet. It made me curl up into myself. And I tried to be frumpy. I didn't wear the heels. I tried to put a head over my shirt. I put a sweatshirt on. I didn't put my makeup on. I tried to look ugly. I tried to look hidden. And the irony was the more I did that, the more things would happen. And I already today, when I wear my heels, when I wear my short skirt, and I'm myself, and I feel good about myself, I don't get that attention. And what that taught me was the importance of speaking out. What that taught me is that when you're in a situation, like you know, these women were talking about, you know, when the person said that I couldn't, you know, she was, someone thought she was making a game sign, she didn't say something. I would turn it around and say that we all have responsibilities to say something to each other. We have a responsibility to educate each other. Because maybe the woman that I know exactly what you're talking about, because I grew up in Highland Park and I got a lot of people that talk about this, and I've learned how to do that if I have to. <laughs> and I've learned that that's part of the game that you play, and I grew to that world. But at the same time, what I found is that it takes so little to be that first person to speak of openly and honestly. And when you do, you open up a little bit of a door. And you might find that there are a lot of people that think the same way you do too. So what I'm going to do is ask each of our artists to explain what they did. Mine is just a little interpretation of a woman not having access to art literally. So I went more, um, I thought about uh, doing um, more representational work, but then I thought about what the person said about stereotypes and sort of access, and I didn't want to replicate in the art stereotypes about women, so then I thought, well, let's do the sign. Let's sort of keep it on a symbolic level, so in order to not replicate some of those ideas, I decided to keep it very minimal. Cool. Thank you. So, I mean, I've been here for a I don't you know all these questions in front of me. I don't know what to say or whatever. And I got this person really connecting to the heart. Like, whenever it gets to talk, to speak out, I believe that we freak out because thought is just out of our understanding. Well, that's what happened to me. But I, I kind of just go back to ask my heart, like, what is what I'm feeling right now? Or ruin myself? Like, what is it? Like, like, it's really got the chance to ask my heart what is it's like feeling. And in that way, I can speak out. Because if not, it'll just take three days to like understand and then finally connect. So I just represent stuff like someone connecting to what's going on in that moment, in that life. And the like, Beautiful. Yes. Should we think? Yeah. No. You can keep it. Okay. Because <laughs> okay, so I heard this woman speak. She came as a child. Probably like most childs that come into the experience of looking for flowers and beautiful things. Beautiful things that happen to her children think that way. We all look that way. Instead, she hit a roadblock. And as she went through this journey, and I'm sure it felt pretty dark. She probably felt very alone for a while. I think sometimes when we get past those moments and the anger sets in. And then we're angry. And she probably I would assume she went through there's a lot of us doing these kinds of situations. As we're walking up, because we are walking up. And eventually she got back to the 
realization, hopefully, the two that she brings on to one. But still, these undertones are now part of who she is, like they're part of her all over her heart. So that one. Thank you. All right, and um, we decided we were going to do kind of a living room. So um, uh, she talked about absence, you know, and loss, and so we um, put two chairs there, and then we um, tried to light up the room with a big uh, lamp. So. Thank you. <laughs> The beauty of when you have people that respond to something that's held at a very deepest level is that you know somebody has received it completely. It's very rare in our day-to-day -day lives that we ever receive each other completely. Because what do we do? You know, we could be walking down streets like I mentioned, but I was running away, afraid of being, you know, gang raped, and ten minutes later somebody said, So how are you doing? You know what I said? Fine. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty much what we do. We could have, you know, the sky is falling, somebody's coming in here with an automatic weapon, and some of them say, oh, I'm fine. That's what we do. We very rarely in our culture ever say, actually, I'm not okay. I'm not okay because I have somebody that's dying. I'm not okay because I have somebody that assumed I was making a gang symbol. I'm not okay because somebody thinks that I am, you know, and retarded because I can't speak the English language. You know, I'm not okay because somebody doesn't look at me and consider I'm a serious artist because I'm a woman. I mean, all of those things that each of the people up here just spoke means that they have a very legitimate reason to be upset, to be expressive. And what that means is that, what transcends that? How do we change from just being upset to being an activist? How do we change from just knowing and recognizing that there's something that needs recognition to being the one to actually speak out about it? The first thing we do is we speak it. The next thing we do is we see that somebody receives it. And then they respond to it. But what can we do to make that go even further? What we do is we take that and it becomes a story. So if I was going to stand here and I was going to make up some kind of form on the spot about this, you know, it would be, and I'm just coming up with something, so bear with me. A child wandering in the dark wonders at night, can she be heard, can she be seen? She looks out into the world and she sees stars and she wonders, do they shine for her or is she forgotten? She goes about at night and she wanders into the world and wonders, how do I have a voice? Do I have something to be heard? Do I have something to be seen? Am I worthy of it? Can I speak it? Can I walk it? Can I do it? Can I dream it? And every single time she turns around the corner, she ends up going, there's something to be discovered. So when you have somebody who's sitting around and wondering, what am I doing here? When you go back to your room, you go back to your journey, you go back to your work tomorrow, and you ask yourself, what do I have that makes me worth hearing? Look in the mirror, because the answer is right there. You're here because every one of your ancestors made a sacrifice. You're here because somebody survived something. You're here because somebody has a great deal of strength. And you inherited all that as well. So when you don't like something that you see, also consider that each one of those things that makes you up is a testimony. You're a living, breathing, walking DNA <laughs> testimony to strength. That's what every single one of you has. That's why you're here. And if you happen to be somebody who didn't come from money, that's part of the story. If you happen to be a woman, that's part of the story. If you happen to be a minority, that's part of the story. Because every single one of those things means that you have to work twice as hard to climb up even harder. That is a remarkable story. There are many ways that you can look at ourselves. And when you first want to identify where do you get your strength to become an activist, to become somebody worth being heard, the first thing you have to ask yourself is, how do I find my story? How do I define myself? Now, I'm going to put somebody on the spot because he's in the front row and he is my father-in-law. <laughs> um, but my father-in-law used to go and work on you know, phone systems. And we were in Rwanda a number of years ago. And I asked him, so what did you say? Oh, nothing special. I just put up phone systems. And I said, well, let me tell you about those phone systems and those wires. When my father was dying, a 
and he fell on the ground and he was frightening in pain because he had glioblastoma and he had a seizure. The first thing we did is we called 911 and they saved his life. And then it happened again and it happened again and it saved his life again and again. And you know why it happened? Because there is somebody in the middle of a storm that raved and risked their life of being struck by lightning and he's been struck by lightning. And who knows how many times, how many people whose lives were saved because somebody could call 911 just like we did for my father. That's part of the story. Now, most people would take a look at something and say, oh, you know, I'm a woman here and I swing, I swing the wires. I look at that story and I say, here, because you may never see the names of the people, know the names of the people, know the number of the people that were saved because it worked that day. So that's what I mean. What kind of story do each of you have? How do you tap into that story and claim it as your own? How do you take the story that is your own and become so conscious of it that it moves you to the point that you can't help but to speak out? That's the question. So when we talk about art and activism, what can we be? What is the potential of an individual? It's limitless. Each one of the people that stood up here is feeling something so authentic. And I can pick any one of you in the audience and ask as well, what do you feel that you have fought hard for? Let's choose somebody else. Who here is fighting a personal battle at this moment in time? Anyone here that is willing to share something that they are fighting very hard about? So now I have the whole room scared. <laughs> That's the first thing you have to get over. Because if you really want to make a difference, it takes being willing to look like an idiot. That's the truth. It takes being willing to go in the middle of something and say, I have a problem. It takes an ego to be able to go up somewhere and say, I'm worth your time. It takes an ego to say, I'm intelligent enough that you owe it to me to listen. If you want to know how to get people to hear your art, you have to be able to go up there and say, I am worth it. You are going to listen to me because I am worth it. You want to know how somebody is going to believe in whatever it is any one of you are doing in your life. You have to claim it. No one is going to hand it to you in this world. What you have to be able to do is go up to any individual and say, this is my story. This is what it took to get here and I have earned it, and I have something unique to give that no one else will. And the reason that's a real thing is because no one else in this world will possess the unique set of experiences each of you has had in your lives. And when you look at the uniqueness of your story, if you can take that and turn it into your art, turn it into your activism, you will have an empowered voice. So, I'm going to go and ask this person. What is your name? I guess the light at the end of the tunnel, and I guess like 
plan that was in front of your grandparents' yard and he's terrorizing you. It turned out this friend was in charge of our interfaith, interracial, intereconomic <laughs> um, efforts of doing things throughout the city of Dallas. So it brought down every single kind of demographic you could think of and mixed them all together to go and do community service. And it broke down all sorts of barriers. And he looked at me and he said, you won? <laughs> and in that moment, I realized, you know, the chances of my having him be the person in charge of our program, and him as his grandfather, he even told me about inheriting his chest with the big red dragon, Mugalia the sword, and all that stuff, and he, how disgusted he was to receive it. And it made me realize, yeah, that is the power of story. And just as we talked about today, each of us has an individual story. Each of us is also part of a much larger story. Stories for the ancestors whose names we will never know. Each of us relies on stories such as with my father-in-law, the next time you call number one, there's somebody just like him that made that whole life possible, that made somebody being saved possible. Each of us has the story of going in somewhere and being thought of less than what we are, being assumed you're not as smart, you're not, you don't have that potential. And every time you're in, confronted with it, we also have the potential to take a hold of that story consciously and to write it in the tent. So we have the potential to stand in front of people and say whatever it is we are, whatever it is we believe. I myself, you know, I was adopted into a white family. I've been told I'm a coconut by a lot of people. You know, when I went to, you know, into the locker rooms, I had a woman come up to me and say, yeah, we're so grateful that you just graduated from high school because now we know there's nothing innately in us that will keep us from it. I remember thinking at that age, and I was only about 17, thanks, but that's kind of sad. <laughs> Because to me, I'd much rather have the, you know, the clan member with the big pointy hat in front of me than have somebody that really thinks they're innately their DNA keeps them from something. You know, that's to me, that's a lot sad. But when you look at these different things, you know, for a long time, my personal spiritual religion and tradition was wicked. I hid it. I hid it as much as I could because I was terrified. But my family hated me. But those people hate me. I lied. I was terrified. Would my family hate me? Would my friends hate me? Every one of these things, you go into a place and people don't know quite what you are, and you zip your lip. But I'll type leave on one little story because I think it'll end up giving you guys each something that will tell you how powerful it is to take a stand. You know, my mother, she was at the Macaulay Country Club, all the women that talk like this, they all have the little hats on, they all have the little nails done, and they're sitting around, and you know, one of them said, well, I just don't like those people. In this particular instance, they were talking about gay men. And it went around the room, and every woman said, I don't like them either. I don't Finally, it got to my mother, and she was one of about 20 women at this table. And one of these, you know, everybody got to her, they all looked at her as if they are expecting her to agree, and she looked out at them, and she said, I have no problem with them. My neighbors are gay. The yard is fine. You know, it looks nice. I don't even hardly see them. They're fine. You know, I don't have any problem. And the next thing she said, the next person said, well, you know, I really don't have a problem either. I said it because I thought all right. And then right around the table, well, I don't have a problem either. Yeah, all these were very wealthy, both public and Caucasian women. Right. Then they finally went around the table and realized no one had a problem. But it took one person to say they did so that's the power of speaking out. Sometimes you might be surprised at what you discover. Sometimes, like the young woman that stood here talking about how someone assumes she's making a gang sign, you might be surprised if you turn around to the lady that talks like that and says, say to her, guess what? No, that wasn't a gang sign. I was excited about that. You know, I actually don't know any gang signs. It might wake her up. It might also wake you up and realize saying maybe she just honestly had no idea. A lot of times we make assumptions about each other. How can we change the world around us? We can change the world around us by daring. We can change the world around us by speaking. We can change the world around us by creating. We can change the world around us by not being quiet. 
We can change the world around us by being outrageously, genuinely, truthfully who and what we are and unapologetically speaking out. Thank you. So I'll go ahead and open up the floor uh, to any questions or, or comments or, or if folks want to share their own stories, perhaps. Please speak up, though. <laughs> How was it growing up in Highland Park and being different than everybody else? It was very strange in some respects. When I was really young, the only people that looked like me were gardeners and housekeepers. And that was very strange. And it went both ways. Um, you know, on one hand, you know, there is you know, a lot of, oddly enough, and I'm not going to be politically correct here, oddly enough, a lot of the Asian people went overboard to not, to, to be sensitive. And I was very grateful for that. Ironically, I got much more of a hard time by the Hispanic population. Mm -hmm. It was more of the coconut thing. Who do you think you are that you can walk that way, speak that way, act that way? You know, who do you think you are to be the one eating in the restaurant and not, you know, not serving? You? Um, <coughs> and that I think has been the biggest difference I've seen. You know, um, when I started dating in high school, you know, I you get who you're around. So I was a lot of a lot of white people. Um, so I would introduce you to date, and I would go to the mall and get spat on. Um, interestingly enough, just as by as much by Hispanics as by white. Now you know I go there, and my husband and I walk in, and there's no problem, no issue. Um, you know, there's I see a lot of interracial families. You know, um, so you know that. So it was hard. You know, it did teach me. Like I remember being about five and. You know, kids pulling out the towels from under my feet when you're swimming pools because they said, don't let her touch the towel, see she's brown, that's because she doesn't bathe. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of it was ignorance. And looking back on it, I think I would blame more the parent for not explaining the concept of melanin <laughs> <laughs> and things like that that I would do. Any other questions? How do you find a balance between your activism and your art? One, I find, helps me understand the other. You know, sometimes I don't even realize I'm making a point. I have a, a piece called Spiritual Anatomy, and it brings the, um, the Kabbalah, the Chakras, and the Seven Sacraments of Christianity together. And I was showing it in New York, and you know, only in New York which happened. But in that particular corner booth that I was at, I happened to have a Hasidic rabbi come over, a Buddhist monk come over, and a Hindu um, come over, and they, um, a, a priest, and they all came and they looked at it and they recognized their iconography and they could see how it was sharing the same information, how it related. And they look at it and they look at me and they look at it and they look at each other and it was like, I don't know if I like having something in common with it. So sometimes, you know, one ends up helping the other because of tool. Could you speak about um, there was a recent incident on campus with the Fiji House where they held a border patrol party, uh, very insulting, very hurtful to the Latino community here, but also I think to even a larger community that respects Latinos and is not very conservative. How do we speak out? We we had forum, but we seem to get a lot in terms of getting any response. I think that there's a lot of power, you know, in, in stories. I think, again, you have to make yourself human. I find that people can only interact in a negative, let me put this basic, in a bigoted perspective <coughs> with that which they do not find human. Once they recognize another human being, it's almost impossible to be a bigot. So, you know, the, you know, if you're trying to reach you, somebody, you have to make it personal. You know, I think sometimes looking into the history, like you know, Sylvia Rusco uh, at the Mexican Arts Museum, you know, shares the history a lot of people don't know about Austin. That the reason why the majority of the Hispanic community is on one side of the city is because the Ku Klux Klan came and forced them to move, and actually even moved an entire church to the other city and rebuilt it. You know, that's history. And I think that if people were to share that history and then say we're not going back. And if that history were shared with the Hispanic community locally, and say we were sh literally shoved to the side one time, we're not being shoved this time, 
when people can call upon their ancestors and that history, they can say, I'm, you know, we are not being shoved aside. And that would empower the Hispanic community. And I think also when that is told in a broader sense, there are a lot of people just like my employee who are horrified at what role their ancestors play. And so you probably get a lot of Caucasian communities that we are not going to be complacent like our ancestors. So I would say pull on the history and link the history with what's happening currently, and there's a lot of help. So what would, what would be a good way to start, for example, in my case, like I already understand to this point in my life what is about as an ambition, what I want to do and stuff, but, but yet, like the first step to put it in action, like the activism, you know, like I already understood and find what is what I have to bring and things like that. But, but I believe it's like, my question is, well, how can I just start? Like, the first step, you just put it out there. What well, there's you good <laughs> You know, what I would say, not knowing specifics of what it is you're passionate about, I would say, you know, go and find at least two other people that are equally passionate. When you have a group of three, bring together those ideas and then find, you know, what is the thing that you're passionate about between the three that most relates to your community. And when you find that, then you do something that's scary and loud that brings attention to that. Because it's like a spider that becomes a center and it goes off. Any questions? How about you said like if you if somebody is saying something and you feel that you need to speak out, but the people who are saying it are very articulate and are very good speakers and you're not as articulate as them, you know, everybody's kind of on that side of the room and you're here and you're not as articulate as them. How do you kind of overcome that? It doesn't, I mean, it's like in my mother's case, it didn't take much for her to say, I have no problem with them. There is a lot of power in her, and she told me she, she didn't lecture, she didn't make a big statement, she just said, I have no problem. Yeah, that's your issue that I have no problem with. And something about just stating it, because people assume if you don't speak out, they assume you agree. And that's really important to the process. If you're silent, people assume you agree. So the most powerful thing is often just, I don't agree with that. And you don't owe it to people to give them an explanation either. I mean, you know, there have been times where the most powerful thing I found I should say, I don't agree, and I got up and left. Because, you know, there is something that hurts the soul at a deep level if someone is going on and on about something that um, you, at a deep, more moral, ethical level, disagree with, and you have to sit there. <coughs> that, eventually, it, it hurts your core. <coughs> so, instead of, you know, subjecting yourself to that, you know, get, you know you're going to be uncomfortable sitting there, or it's going to be uncomfortable getting up. But it's going to be uncomfortable less, <laughs> and you'll leave feeling empowered for having gotten up. But tell them why. 